What can you say about him? Dangerous, uh, volatile, even outright destructive. Today's band is what rock and roll is all about. Breaking onto the scene in the mid 80s, uh, their hard hitting music and their reputation absolutely freaked out the media establishment. I mean, radio refused to play them. They were blacklisted by MTV even. Oh, and parents confiscated what few tapes actually got sold. I mean, as unbelievably talented as these guys were, their music it was never going to see the light of day. But just as their label was about to give up on them, one never say die a and man threw up a Hail Mary. He begged his boss to call in a favor to MTV, and this band's video was given one solitary play on the channel in the worst possible time slot. Would it work? Find out the all-time rock and roll underdog story of a band that went from never heard of him to the biggest debut record ever. Coming up on Professor Rock, it's a great story. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever uh, drew band names all over your Trapper Keeper or your folders growing up, you're gonna dig this channel of extreme musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button, click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Also check us out on Patreon, that really helps us do more interviews and keep the channel going. We are a self-funded channel. You can become an honorary producer as well. We also have our merch. I'm excited to return to another one of my favorite shows that we do on this channel. Uh, it's called Breakthrough. We break down the songs or albums or events that kicked open the door to an artist or band's career and gave them momentum to rocket to long-term success. Oh man, for today's installment, we're gonna take the night train to the jungle, baby. I'm talking about the breakthrough hit, Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses course, from their 1987 masterpiece debut record, Appetite for Destruction. You know, Guns N' Roses' classic lineup was actually stabilized on June 4th, 1985, when lead guitar Slash and drummer Steve Adler joined the trio of Izzy Stradlin and rhythm guitarist Duff McKagan on bass, and of course, intrepid frontman Axl Rose. Uh, the young band played their first live show together just two days later, and soon after, they set off on a trip now known as their Hell Tour. Uh, this is a haphazard run up the Pacific coast from California to Seattle, Washington, and it definitely lived up to its name. According to the book Watch You Bleed, the saga of Guns N' Roses, great book, you should check it out, I'll link to it below. Uh, the members of GNR made the trip to Seattle in one vehicle while roadies drove their gear up in a second one. Unfortunately, both vehicles broke down on the way and Guns N' Roses had to hitchhike the rest of the way to Seattle. I uh, actually had their guitars in hand. Um, the rest of their equipment was supposed to follow in their wake, but that never happened. Uh, the band arrived to play a Seattle show with the band, the Fastbacks, who loaned the guys uh, their drums and their amps for that night. Reportedly, Axel and company, they were only paid about 50 bucks for the show, and they had to cancel all the other gigs that they booked since they didn't have their gear. It was an unmitigated disaster. The band members had the bummer ride back to Hollywood with next to nothing to show for their efforts. Still, Duff McKagan, he would describe the short-lived tour as a moral victory. He said the trip had set a new benchmark for what we were capable of, what we could and would put ourselves through to achieve our goals as a band. After returning to California, Guns N' Roses settled into another blazing hot mess with a similar moniker. The famed Hell House, uh, an impoverished West Hollywood hovel that doubled as the band's rehearsal space, perpetually surrounded by heavy partying, drugs, debauchery, and constant chaos. This was their home sweet home. <laughs> Through 1985 and 1986, Guns N' Roses continued to make a name for themselves on the Hollywood club scene. Played the likes of the, the Roxy and the Troubadour, and uh, then when they released their EP, Live Like a Suicide, um, that's what the band refers to it as, this was on the independent Uzi Suicide label, that's when critics and labels started to take notice. As Guns N' Roses drew the attention of major record labels from there, they caught the eye of one man in particular and it was destined to be. Talking about Tom Zuta, a and man at Geffen. Tom saw Guns N' Roses perform at the Troubadour and he was sold after just one song. I mean, he was completely blown away by the talent of lead guitar Slash and he was awestruck by the power and the magnetism of Axl Rose. Zuta realized that this band was the perfect counterpoint to Hollywood's glam metal scene. 
I mean, these guys were dangerous. They were rebellious. They were outright volatile. Their music, it just exploded in your ears. Tom accurately predicted that GNR would become the biggest band in the world. And he told his boss as much, David Geffen. Zutat was so sure of Guns N' Roses after that one show, he requested a $75,000 advance to sign them. Now, the guys joined Geffen shortly after. It was in March of 86. Tom Zutat and the band considered multiple producers when gearing up for their debut album, Appetite for Destruction. Uh, Bob Ezrin was considered, Motley Crue's Nikki Six and Kisses Paul Stanley were all in the mix. But ultimately, it was Mike Klink who took the reins. He was an engineer known for working with the so-called soft rock producer Ron Nevison. Ron Nevison, who did a lot of different things, but uh, he'd currently just done uh, 1987 uh, Hearts Bad Animals album. It was kind of counterintuitive and not exactly in the same realm as Guns N' Roses. I mean, at this point, Klink's resume included some of the less successful albums from uh, Jefferson Starship and Survivor and Eddie Money. All of them a far cry from the menacing sound of One Guns N' Roses. But, you know, Mike Kling, for his part, he was a studio veteran, and he was undeterred by the, the band's controversial reputation. While proving to be a firm hand, he was also flexible, and he let the guys be exactly who they were. In August of 1986, Geffen booked the band into Rumbo Studios in Canoga Park, Los Angeles. But as recording sessions began... Zutat and Kling, they started to realize they had their work cut out for them if they were going to keep the band, you know, focused and out of jail. <laughs> Look, Guns N' Roses exploits have been well documented over the years, so I won't go into details here. But for our purposes, I'll point out that this band was very unpredictable and usually turned up late for everything. If they even turned up at all. I mean, it's kind of rock and roll, right? So that means if you were lucky enough to get all five members together and ready to record, you had to seize the moments, you know. In an unprecedented move, Tom Zutat secured a private purchase order book so that he could reserve studio time at any hour. He also put Mike Klink on red alert and made sure the producer was ready to race to the studio at a moment's notice. You know, if GNR was ready to go, they would be too. Miraculously, by December of 86, all of Appetite's 12 track set was finished. After hearing the final result, Mike and Tom, they were certain that this album and this band were going to take the world by storm. They were going to be huge. They even made bets on how many millions of copies it would sell. Appetite for Destruction, that was released worldwide on July 31st, 1987, and released six singles. It's So Easy, Mr. Brownstone in the UK, Sweet Child of Mine, uh, Paradise City, and Night Train. Oh, and Welcome to the Jungle. It's so Now, in regards to writing Welcome to the Jungle, let's just say that there are a few different stories surrounding its origin. We'll talk about all of them. Uh, in one version, the song started out with just a simple riff. It said Slash about it. I had this riff, and I remember playing it for Axel on an acoustic guitar. I said, check this out. <laughs> Axel liked what he heard, and during the next rehearsal, the band developed it into a full-on structured song. It was really the first thing that we all collaborated on, Slash said. It's really a combination of everybody's input. Now, Duff McKagan, he remembered it a little differently. In his autobiography, he stated that uh, Welcome to the Jungle goes clear back to 1978 in his days in the teenage punk band Veins. McKagan would go on to say that uh, Jungle came out of a song titled The Fake. And GNR insider Pamela Manning She's also made some comments about uh, the creation of the song, where it came from. Uh, Pamela remembers being at the rehearsal studio with the band. And what she said, and I quote is, I remember Axel. He pressed this button on an old tape machine and said, you got to listen to this. It was a little recording, Welcome to the Jungle, that he did. And he says, now we're going to rehearse it. He made the band listen to it for a while, and they got up and they rehearsed it. I mean, Axel just sang his head off. I remember seeing his face turn really red uh, when he was singing, and I was wondering if he was getting any breath. End of quote. 
Now, as we further break down the lyrics and the other aspects of this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always wear on here. You got to trust me when I tell you, Zenny will upgrade your look. Add some style to your repertoire with their retro looks. There are so many frames to choose from. Click on our info button right up here to get special Professor Rock pricing. Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games. Now, as far as the lyrics go uh, for Welcome to the Jungle, those were written by Axl Rose completely. Actually, in an interview with Spin Magazine, he reported that the song's title and some of its lyrics they came from an encounter that he and a friend had when they ran away to New York City for the first time. At some point after stepping off their bus into the Big Apple, this homeless guy, he put a scare into him. He yelled at him, you know where you are? You're in the jungle, baby, and you're gonna die. You're in the jungle, baby. You're gonna die. Of course, later that rant went down in history. It would be lyrical gold. Incidentally, the uh, anonymous screamer, the homeless guy, he was left off the songwriting credits. Your favorite heard the song. Further elaborating, Axel explained in an interview with Hit Parader magazine that he wrote the song's lyrics while the band was in Seattle during the aforementioned Hell Tour that I talked about. Apparently, visiting the Emerald City, that provided Axel with some added insight into his own personal jungle. L.A., Los Angeles. It's a big city, the singer said about Seattle. But at the same time, it's still a small city compared to L.A. And the things that you're going to learn. Then speaking directly to the song, he said, I just wrote how L.A. looked to me. Someone comes to town and they want to find something, they can find whatever they want. So if there was ever any question about what it's about, Los Angeles is the city that Jungle was inspired by. Welcome to the jungle. It's all about uh, the struggle for survival. You learn to live like an animal in the jungle where we play. In one line, Axel referred to the destructive temptations that threaten to wreck his band. When you're high, you never ever want to come down. According to Slash, this was a very telling lyric. Just the stark honesty of it is what he said. If you lived in Los Angeles and lived in the trenches, so to speak, you could relate to it. And knowing Axel, I could relate to exactly where it was coming from." End of quote. The video itself, it's somewhat autobiographical in nature, uh, a stylized reenactment of Axel's arrival to LA and subsequent transformation. It begins with the, the hayseed version of Axel, you know, stepping off a bus and immediately encountering a drug dealer, portrayed by Izzy. After Rose rejects his offer, he stops to check out some televisions playing through a store window. On them, he can see a deranged version of himself screaming in an electric chair. Close by, Slash poses as a hapless wino sitting on the sidewalk. Now, as the music ramps up, the video kicks into a performance of the band playing on stage, of course, and it's everything and more that you would come to expect from Guns N' Roses uh, in concert. Also, throughout the video, scenes of Axel watching TV screens fill with images of war and destruction. Eventually, we see a stray jacket version of Axel taking it all in, presumably completing his transformation from unassuming hick to a uh, hardened rocker, if you will. Okay, so here's the thing. Although Guns N' Roses and Tom Zutat and Mike Klink knew they had killed it in the studio, they knew they had something special, the suits over at Geffen, including David Geffen himself, they were skeptical about this finished record. <laughs> I don't know how you could be. They actually braced themselves to absorb a considerable deficit against a band's $75,000 advance. Despite the efforts of Geffen's promotional team, nobody could break this band on radio or TV. I mean, to be fair, the record blatantly championed drug use, uh, repeatedly fired off expletives, and it originally showcased a science fiction assault scene on the cover. Believe it or not, nine months after its release, a lot of people don't remember this, nine months after its release, the lack of media exposure and the underwhelming response from the critics left appetite for destruction dead in the water. 
Sales in the U.S. were circling the drain at just 200,000 units. To make matters worse, there was no chance that Guns N' Roses were going to get any exposure on MTV. I mean, MTV was a critical part of promoting bands, especially back in the 80s. If you weren't on MTV, you weren't going to make it. Uh, you were completely missing the attention of the younger generation without that MTV exposure. Now, back then, half of the network's cable outlets were owned by ultra-right-wing conservative John Malone. He'd actually warned MTV that if they played any dangerous junkie bands, he would drop the channel from all of his cable affiliates in a heartbeat. This was a serious threat. You know, with Guns N' Roses' a hedonistic reputation working against them, the band was completely blacklisted from MTV, from the network. Regardless of that, Geffen saw all that had transpired as a good start. You know, they were willing to live with the record sales. So they kind of chalked it up to what it was, a new band that was just paying their dues, getting their name out there. They believed the appetite had run its course officially. So the label decided it was time to pull the plug on the album. Geffen CEO, Ed Rosenblatt, he called Zutat into his office and told him, you know, it's over. He said that Tom should start thinking about the band's next album. Zutat, he refused to concede defeat, though. He put his career on the line here. Tom went over this guy's head, and he begged David Geffen to call in a favor to MTV. Moved by his a r man's pleas and his passion, David Geffen agreed to call MTV's Tom Freston. He asked him to lift the ban on this up-and-coming band. Uh, the chief executive, he agreed to stop the van for one time, a one-time only exception. He would give Welcome to the Jungle one shot in the middle of the night on a Sunday morning. Pretty much the worst time slot that he could think of. When David Geffen told Tom the news, the a r man, he was disheartened, but he reluctantly accepted his fate. I mean, that was it. Appetite for Destruction, it was really finished. So to commemorate all that they had done, Zutat stayed up all night with the band to watch the video and, you know, just celebrate their five minutes of fame before they could move on. But a funny thing happened. That one and only graveyard showing a welcome to the jungle, that was all Guns N' Roses needed to go completely viral. After the video aired, uh, viewers bombarded MTV with calls demanding repeat plays. Uh, tying up the switchboard in the process, and then the next day phones were ringing off the hook at the record company as well. When Zutat came into work, he was shocked to discover that this Hail Mary had actually been caught inside the end zone. Guns N' Roses had made it. Within days, Welcome to the Jungle, it was MTV's most requested video. Uh, thrown into heavy rotation from there, Guns N' Roses, they completely blew up. Appetite for Destruction went from 200,000 cells to a million practically overnight. And in time, of course, it would become the highest selling debut record of all time, moving 18 million copies in the U.S. alone and uh, over 30 million worldwide. All thanks to the improbable success of one late night music video. Uh, it was a phenomenal and unexpected breakthrough. Welcome to the Jungle. This was GNR's call to arms served as a fitting introduction to the band. Released on September 28, 1987, the song ultimately shot to number seven on the Billboard Hot 100. Internationally, it reached number 24 in the UK, went to number 14 in Ireland, 13 in Finland, and went to number six in New Zealand. Years later, VH1 named it number one on the list of the 100 greatest hard rock songs. As for Appetite for Destruction, that album, it accelerated to number one on the Billboard 200, went to number one on the U.S. Top Hard Rock Albums chart as well. Appetite went to top 10 in most everywhere in the world, went to number five in the U.K., number three in Spain, number two in Germany, number one in Italy and, and New Zealand. Now, since that breakout moment, Welcome to the Jungle, it's appeared in all sorts of pop culture renderings. It's tattooed pop culture. Uh, lean on me. <laughs> the Deadpool, Selena, The Simpsons, Arrow, Supernatural, Megamind, How to Be Single, Insatiable, Thor, Love and Thunder, 911. 
And both Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle and Jumanji The Next Level, of course. Don't cry, it's gonna be okay. Welcome to the Jungle has been covered by Hellstorm, Still Panther, Alice Cooper, Shakira. Pink, Brett Michaels, Perfect Circle did it. And Carrie Underwood with Axl Rose. You also hear Welcome to the Jungle in sports stadiums across America. The number of teams laying claim to uh, this famous track. In the new millennium, Welcome to the Jungle has gone on to tally over 2 billion streams. That makes it Guns N' Roses' second most streamed song of all time, coming in just behind Sweet Child of Mine. Actually, Sweet Child of Mine's ahead of it by quite a bit. Appetite for Destruction you think about it, it was one of the last albums where rock and roll was dangerous, in your face, and real. Everybody from my generation has their own unique experience with this album. It was a record that reached across the aisle to every demographic. Everybody had appetite for destruction. I remember when I was a kid, my dad took my copy away from me, you know, because I was playing it too loud. And you know, the next day I went out to his shop, his paint shop, right next to our house where he'd work, he'd varnish cabinets. My mom wanted me to go call him in for dinner. Lo and behold, found him rocking out to Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. He'd taken my copy and he was playing it as loud as his speakers would go. I couldn't believe it. He hadn't confiscated my tape because I was playing it too loud or it was bad. He took it because he wanted to listen to it. All of a sudden, I had the coolest dad in the world. That happened a lot. I mean, while everybody else's dads were playing Alabama's greatest hits, my dad was varnishing cabinets to welcome to the jungle. Again, that's how monumental this record was and still is. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Guns N' Roses and Welcome to the Jungle and Appetite for Destruction. What are your memories of this record, of this song, your experience? Tell me your story. What happened the first time that you heard this record? I mean, it's just, it's one of those monumental records. Uh, only five or six moments like this happen in your entire life, in my opinion. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our content. Until next time, three chords. And the truth, my friends.